That was a great illustration talking about kind of uh, oil and water and what it means for us to kind of uh, invade the world that's around us. Uh, we were trying to do a little bit of invading Pike Lakes with some fishing yesterday, but it was more like oil and water. They had no interest in anything we were casting, not even a nibble. But as we said, what is it? A bad day fishing is better than a good day, and you fill in the blank with whatever you want, right? So anyway, that is a great setup to what we are going to be spending some time talking about together today. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we recognize how desperately we need you, and Lord, this morning to be reminded of how we need your Spirit. Lord, how, uh, Lord, we can't live and move and have our being that Lord, so often why we try to do things on our own to recognize this day how we need to rest in and rely on your power. Lord, would it be that power that speaks into this place this morning that engages us where we are so that we can see you and hear you and know you in a uh, deeper way today. So Lord, we just pray that as we spend time uh, unpacking Acts 17, uh, Lord, would you just uh, speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit? And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you like to fish, you know that one of the best times is either right before a storm, in the middle of maybe a nice drizzle, or immediately after a storm has come and gone. That seems to be the time when fish bite best. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, though, when we were down in uh, Florida, we were fishing on the Gulf of Mexico, and we were actually fishing right from shore that day. And we had an opportunity to cast out, but we looked to the south, and there was storms that were building. In fact, you've got a couple of pictures here to see what that looked like. So there we are on the edge of the shore. We're fishing, and we look down to the south, and we can see this storm that is slowly moving to the north. But we didn't want to give up fishing, and so we kept going, and we kept going until here you have the storm, which is right on us. And it was at that point that we said, you know what? We probably should call it a day. And so we packed it in, we made it to our cars, and in that moment, the heavens opened and the rain began to fall. Now, here's the thing. If you're in a boat during a storm like that, you know that the safe bet is to pack it in and to head back to shore. You don't want to be caught out in a storm like that, yet... We also know people who are willing to brave the storms. They're, they're willing to go in to places where they put their life at, at risk. Now, why do we do that? Well, it's because I got to have one more cast. I got to have one more opportunity. You know, there's one more chance. Maybe this last cast will be the one when I'm finally able to catch a fish. We know it's easy to fish when the weather is nice outside. But real fishermen are willing to put up with some things. They're willing to get up before the sun rises. They're willing to stay out after the sun sets. They're willing to go out, whether it's hot in the heat of the day or in the cold, over the wintertime. We would drive past Pike Lake and see people like hunker down, ice fishing. I'm like, that's crazy. Right? There's no way I would freeze my butt off, but you know what? They were dedicated. Why? Because they were willing to put up with the elements in order to find fish. Now, over the course of these past three weeks, now we're into our fourth week, we've been unpacking together what does it mean for us to be a people who are going and fishing. We've been saying this isn't about us actually going out and fishing fishing, but for us to remember that we are to be fishers of people. And we said in week one that what we're doing is we're following our call, that it was Jesus who said to go and to be gospel fishermen. In week two, we were saying, well, what is it that we fish with? And we were saying that there's no greater story than the story of a transformed life. And so what we do is we share the way in which Jesus has changed our lives 
And we go and we share that with the people that are around us. And then last week we talked about what does it mean for us to be chum, for us to be able to engage with the people that are around us, to rub shoulders with people who might not look like us, talk like us, act like us, people that some may consider the other, some that may be considered the enemies. And yet, to say we have to see beyond those things in order to engage people. And today, as we close out this series, I want to open it up a little bit farther and talk about how do we engage the culture in which we live. If last week we were talking about um, really sharing our faith and our story with our neighbors, getting to know the people that are right around us, how do we begin to engage the broader culture that exists around us. You know, if we were saying last week that we have a tendency to treat other people as the enemy or the other, that could certainly be one of the things that, that people of faith kind of look at the culture and wonder, how do I engage? Do I look at my culture as being the enemy? And what I hope we discover today is that when the storms seem to set in, we really have one of two choices. We can be the type of people who pack it up and say, okay, you know what, it's just easier if I just kind of hang out in my own holy huddle. Or are we going to be the people who say, I'm going to brave the storms and I'm going to head out into the storms to engage it. And this is what we're going to be talking about. How are you and I called to be salt and light? right? To bring light into the dark places, to bring seasoning to those things in those places that need it. And then to think about, well, how do we do that by being in the world, but not of the world? And I think if you're a person of faith, this is oftentimes where the tension can begin to, to set in. How do we engage our culture while, while not saying, I want to diminish the work of, of Jesus Christ. See, because ultimately, if we think that the church simply exists for the church, we're going to find that the church is going to experience ill health. It's, it's going to slowly, what are we going to see? Start dying, right? Because we need to engage the community and the people around us. Now, Here's what you and I need to understand, that when we choose to engage the culture that exists around us, it means that we are going to confront belief systems and value systems that are contrary to our own. And in fact, belief systems and value systems that run contrary to the truth of the gospel itself. And when that happens, we have to ask, how am I supposed to engage? And the overarching question that I want to look at this morning is, how are we to engage the world when we are confronted with value systems that run contrary to the gospel? All right, how are we to engage the world when we are confronted with value systems that run contrary to the gospel? Now, I think what oftentimes can happen is that Christians see the world that's around us, and what is our default behavior? It's to be offended, right? We're offended by the things that we see happening around us. And what happens is our culture views Christians as, well, people who are easily offended, right? Uh, Offended by the language that gets used, offended by lifestyle choices. We're offended by values that people proclaim here's what we need to understand is it may totally be true, right? That their belief system or behavior is offensive in the face of the gospel. Because here's what we need to recognize. The gospel is offensive to those who don't believe. But to those who do, it is the very power of God. And so we have to recognize this as we engage the culture around us. See, the thing is, most people think of followers of Jesus by what we are against rather than what we are for. Oh, you're against that. You know, you're against that. You know, you fill in the blank, whatever it is. 
that's, that's the tendency of what people have to think about followers of Jesus Christ. And so what ends up happening is the world gets divided into those who are offended by things and those who are not offended by things. And, and, and how do we so often respond? It's like, well, we pull back. We, we want to disengage from the world that's around us. But, but here's what I'm going to ask this morning. Is God calling us to be separatist Christians? Is God calling us to separate out, right? Instead of engaging the world in which we live and taking action in a world that needs restoration and renewal, what do we do? We call for protests and, and boycotts. We wonder, well, what does it mean to be, quote-unquote, in the world, but not of it? And so we wonder, are we supposed to separate out? Now, I think an extreme example of this might be considered uh, the Amish or like Old Order Mennonite. Um, You know, uh, when we lived in in Pennsylvania, there was a community there. It's called Lancaster, but I call it Lancaster. It's just one of those things. I'll never quite get it right. But you know, you think of that, but these people, it was always so fascinating, right, to go and, and to visit these places because you're like, wow, these people that are kind of like disengaged from the culture in which they live in. And yet, I can still remember being in Lancaster the day that a gentleman walked into a school, shot five girls, and then turned and killed himself, right? We happen to be there that day, and there's family members that are calling us and saying like, Did you hear there's something happening in Lancaster? So we're like, whoa, what's going on? Now here's what's interesting is for a community that really values their privacy and kind of being separated out from culture, in this moment, they were really forced into the limelight, right? And what was amazing was the way in which they chose to respond. You want to talk about a counter-cultural way to respond. Not only did they go to the widow's house to say, we forgive your husband for what he did to us, they even went to the man's funeral. Because they knew that, no, who'd want to go and be at that funeral? I mean, and what was amazing is, for a brief time, the Amish were kind of thrown into the limelight. It was a story that even made, like, national news. And what was fascinating is the people that were kind of, the pundits that were talking about it, saying, you know, on the one hand, how amazing this was, but on the other hand, there were pundits that were saying things like they shouldn't be forgiving. This is such an act of evil that they shouldn't do something like this. But, but here's what we see is that here was a group of people who had disengaged, separated out from culture, but then were thrown back into the limelight. And we see the way in which they lived. And, and so the culture doesn't know quite, quite how to handle folks like the Amish. But I think what it does is it helps us to think through like, well, what does it mean for us then to be in the world, but not of it. And so Christians, we ask the questions, and this is what we debate. Uh, Can I drink? Should I smoke? Cultures that are like, can I even dance? Can I go to movies? Right? And, And so we Christians have these debates about these kind of things when the rest of our culture, they're not even asking questions like that. And so how are you and I to get involved? People wonder, right, should we boycott Disney or not? Should we shop at places like Target or not? And that's usually when Christians get thrown into the limelight. We we see films, we hear news stories, we deal with difficult people, and the the feeling is like, ah, I've got to separate out. I've I've got to disengage from this world in which we live. But I think in our scripture passage for this morning, what we're going to see is how we are called to engage our culture in order to go and to gospel fish. In his book, The Next Christians, Gabe Lyons describes it this way. He says, no one, Christians included, can avoid all contact with potentially corrupting people, systems, perspectives, and influences. For everyday followers of Jesus, this tension begs the question, how should Christians react when placed in an environment that celebrates sin, that overlooks injustice, or that tolerates immorality? Now, I recognize 
that is a ton of setup to get to our scripture passage this morning. But I do believe that scripture has something to say about how you and I are to engage the culture in which we live. What does it mean for us to build bridges rather than to burn them down? so that we can gospel fish among people who need it. So if you've got your Bibles handy, I want to invite you to open to Acts chapter 17. We're going to be spending some time together there. We're going to be looking at verses 16 to 34. And as you're turning there, you know, the first question is, are we to be a people who disengage, who pull back, who are offended, I believe that what we see in this passage is that God calls us to be a provoked people, okay? That we are to be a provoked people. See, offended people want to know, want you to know that they're offended because what do they do? They register complaints. They want you to know how what you have done easily affects them, but provoked people are called to do something about it. They don't want people to simply know that they're upset. They want to restore and to redeem and to make things better. And this is exactly what we see Paul doing. And so as we look at verse 16, we're going to read through the 21st verse. I want you to hear what it says. Now, by the way, I'm reading from the ESV this morning because the word provoked is closer to the original Greek than what you see in the NIV. So listen to what it says. It says, now Paul was waiting for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons. These are God-fearing Gentiles. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. I want to give you a little bit of background and some context so you understand the passage that we just read. I want you to think about this for just a moment. That as Paul enters into the city of Athens, he would have had every reason to be offended as a Jewish follower of Jesus. Athens was a place that was filled with idols. In fact, some scholars think that Athens was so filled with these idols that it was like a massive altar. And what they say is that the columns that were built there in the city around the gates were built in such a way as to have all kinds of phallic attributes. So you can imagine that as a Jewish follower of Jesus, Paul could have entered into this city and been offended by the things that he would have seen. Notice what it says. It says that he was provoked in his spirit. Now, the English word here for provoked uh, really comes around, it, it comes from the word paraxuno in the Greek, and it's where we get the word paradox from. So you can imagine that he goes into the city and he's pulled, right? This paradox, this tension of like, ah, oh, I see what's happening here. I want to be offended by it. But notice, it's not that he was simply distressed by what he saw, but he was provoked to what? To do something about it. He doesn't just go into the city and start railing against it. 
He doesn't say, hey, we need to boycott the things that are happening here. He doesn't say, we're going to rise up and we need to reject the leaders that are in charge of this city. He doesn't see the storm that's in front of him and say, okay, I'm out of here. I'm going to run. What does he do? He engages. And this is what I want us to understand. Fishing requires that we engage our culture. All right, that we engage our culture. Notice what it says, by the way, in verse 17. It says, So he reasoned with them in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. He reasoned with them. He talked about the hope of the gospel. And notice what did he do first? He went to the synagogue. He goes to the people that he might be familiar with, the culture that he would be familiar with. So the Jewish people who were there, the Greek God-fearers who were there, people who were already open to some of these ideas perhaps, and he would begin to talk about them because he understood the culture, and so he was able to speak into it. Then he would go to the marketplace, and the marketplace was known as the Agora. Now, when you think of the Agora, this is more than just the local Meijer or the local Walmart or the local place where people would go in order to get their groceries. There was a little bit more to it than that. This was the center of culture. This is where people would go and they would begin to exchange different ideas. It was the center of the media. It was the news outlet. When people needed to know what was happening in this city, they'd go into the Agora to find out what was happening there. It was the intellectual center where people would go and they would begin to exchange ideas. If you wanted to think about what it is in modern day, like a modern day equivalent, imagine what kind of like a Starbucks might be or like your local bookstore right, where people would go in, they might be able to eat something, but then they could go and they would begin to exchange these ideas. And as Paul goes into the Agora, he reasons with them. He doesn't go in there and he says, you know what, I'm just so offended by the things that I see that I'm just going to reject you and I'm going to just go and wait for Jesus to return because that would be so much easier. Notice he engages them and he does it in a way where they say, you know what, we think we'd like to hear a little bit more, right? And so in verse 18, they're intrigued. They're like, I've never heard stuff like this before. And so they invite him to come back. And in verse 19, he goes into what is called the Areopagus because they want to hear more. Now, what is the Areopagus? It's an even deeper gathering of the intellectual elite. It's the philosophers, It's the lawyers. It's the teachers. He's now been invited to like Harvard and to Princeton. They want to hear more about what he has to say. And in doing so, Paul shares one of the most culturally engaging and spiritually relevant sermons that maybe has ever been preached in the entire New Testament. Listen to what he says in verses 22 to 23. It says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. He says, hey, what is unknown to you, I am going to make known to you. Paul recognizes that the people there, they're like pursuing something transcendent, right? They've got all of these different gods that they're worshiping. So many gods that they're like, well, we don't want to leave one out. And so we better make sure that we make an altar to something that may be out there that we've forgotten about. What Paul recognizes is they haven't quite connected all the dots yet. And so he's willing to go into that culture and say, aha, let me share with you something. He says, all of this searching that you're doing, it is all found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus This man who came into this world to live 
and to die and to rise again. He goes and he tells them that they need to repent. And what happens? Notice, by the way, what happens is we pick up in verse 24 to 28. It says this, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far off from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. You know what I love? Paul knows their culture so well, he's even able to quote one of their poets. And he's able to say, hey, guess what? Here's what your own poet has said about this. I love the idea that you and I could potentially know what's happening on TV, what's happening in movies, what's happening in music, what people are saying. Why? So that we can build bridges in order to speak into the culture around us. You know, we were saying last week we can have all of these different kind of responses. And what were the responses that Paul has here? It's the same as it always is, right? As, as he goes and as he begins to preach and as he's telling them about Jesus and the need to repent, what happens? Some people believe. They're like, yes, we're willing to follow. Some people are going to want to hear more. And some people are going to reject it. But that doesn't mean that we don't speak up. We speak into the culture in which God has placed us. Notice what it says in verses 32 to 34. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. If all we do is just get offended, we miss out on the opportunity to engage the culture around us. It is hard for us to engage when we disassociate and say, I'm not willing to to rub shoulders. And I wonder if our staying offended at people says more about us and maybe our unwillingness to love than it does about the other person. Yes, we need to be angry about sin and its destructive behavior in people's lives and in the world, but we're not going to be able to talk to people about the hope of Jesus if all we do is simply be offended. If all we do is protest what's happening in our world. I think we need to be like Paul. Paul had every reason to be offended, and yet he showed them compassion by actively engaging them with the hope of Christ. So the question is, how do we engage? All right, how do we engage? In the book that I was referencing before, The Next Christians by Gabe Lyons, he talks about seven areas of cultural influence in our world. There's a slide here that I want you to see. And so what he says is that you've got the media, okay, on one side, and you've got arts and entertainment, you've got the business, you've got education, you've got government, you've got the social sector, and you've got the church channel. And what he says is that every single person is involved in one of these channels, either in terms of their vocation or in terms of their interests. Now, when you and I think about this, we think that the church channel is the only channel by which we can work and the only channel by which God redeems and restores the world. And so what we think is we've got to get everybody out of these other channels into the church channel. That's the only way. And so what do we do is we build these silos, right? And so you've got the church 
silo over here, and you've got the media and the arts and the entertainment silo, and you've got the business silo, and we try to just say, okay, that's their silos. They do their thing over there. We're just going to worry about the church channel. But instead of thinking about things vertically, the, the idea is that we need to actually topple the church channel over. And we need to think about the fact that we have an opportunity to influence all of these other areas. Now, by the way, you want to know what this looks like. Let's just use a simple example of the way in which uh, so much of our, our society thinks differently about a whole host of social issues. Um, 30 to 40 years ago, right, what happened is when we think about areas like marriage, People that said, okay, we're going to work outside of just simply arts and entertainment, but we're going to make sure that we get people invested in areas of education, in the government. And, and guess what happens, right? Forty years later, we've seen a, a shift in the way in which people think on a whole host of different areas. Why? It's because the church channel said, we're just going to focus on us over here without really investing in all of the other channels that are around us. But here's what we need to be thinking of is, if you think about it, you know most of the time people who are in the media, they're just hanging out with media people all day. People who are in arts and entertainment, they're hanging out with arts people all day. If you're in business, you're hanging out with business people all day. If you're in education, you're hanging out with education people all day. But guess what? The church is the only channel that has everybody else in it on a Sunday morning. Ah, so now we have an opportunity to influence and to engage all of these other channels that are around us. I mean, think about it. We have people from arts and entertainment here every single week. We have teachers that are here every single week. We have business owners here every single week, government people. You know, and so the church is this channel by which we can influence the culture that's around us. That means that this morning, we have people here who are cleverly disguised as business owners, right? as engineers, as teachers, as stay-at-home parents. Now, when I say cleverly disguised, I'm not talking about keeping your faith cleverly disguised. You are a follower of Jesus first and foremost, but then you think about what you wear and what you do as you go out into the world. You have an opportunity to engage all of these different areas of our culture and to begin to speak into these things. What if you began to look at yourself as a fisher of people right where you are? Where if, what if we began to look at where we live as an opportunity to engage? What does that mean? You, you get involved in the YMCA. You get involved in the local PTO or the different Warsaw clubs. What do we do? We invade the secular marketplace. This is why we need to pray that our children get involved in arts and entertainment. We need to pray that our children become, you know, business owners and leaders. We pray that they become politicians, right? We pray that as we go out into the world, we're engaging the world that lives around us. And what we do is we share the hope of Jesus Christ wherever we go. Now, I want to be clear. This is not about creating a theocracy, all right, this isn't about, you know, raising the banner of Christian nationalism. What this is talking about is saying that you and I have an opportunity to engage the culture in which we live and to begin to see our culture change as we invest in the world that's around us. See, I believe that God has called us to partner in the mission of God to see this world be restored as God has created it and as it will one day be as you and I are living in this time that we have an opportunity to speak and to be redeemers and to re be restorers and to say, God, how are you calling me to be involved in your mission? That as long as God gives us life and breath, 
that we would seek to be those co-laborers to say, God, as, as you see fit to use me, would, would you use me to be a restorer in this culture? You know, back when we, uh, when we lived in Pennsylvania, there was a, a church plant that we were uh, helping to be a part of starting. It was called Liberty, and it was in, in the city, uh, center city, Philadelphia. And uh, one of the things that Pastor Jared said has always stuck with me. He said, you know, we don't want to be against our city. And we don't want to be of our city. He said, we want to be for our city. And he said, you know, people who are against it, it's like, you know, oh, this is what's wrong with our city, and so we're just going to rail against it. And he said, we don't want to be of our city. Like, hey, oh, you believe that? Oh, we do too. Oh, you believe that? We do too. Like, anything goes. He says, but we want people to know that we are for our city. And I think that is a great way for us to think about how God is calling us as a church to engage our city. You know, Warsaw and Winona Lake and to be thinking about the way in which God is saying not to be against it, you know, not, not to be of it, but to be for it. That's why I love what we say is that we want to bring joy to our city that we want to see people being transformed by the grace of God. And I think that's what God is calling us to do. You know, we were saying last week that Jesus was willing to eat with tax collectors. He was willing to eat with sinners of his day, people who didn't look like him, talk like him, act like him. And we talked about the importance for us to show hospitality. And I think even as we show hospitality, and even today as we're called to engage our culture, I want to be clear though, this is not simply showing hospitality for hospitality's sake or engaging for engagement's sake. It is so that we can share the hope of Jesus. By the way, when Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, it wasn't just to show hospitality, it was to call them back to repentance. And as you and I engage the world around us, that's what we need to do. We engage, we love, but we also share the hope of Jesus. And by the way, I I would be remiss if I didn't say on, on Pentecost Sunday that we don't do this in our own power and our own strength, right? We do it in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. It, what we have to remember is that as Paul enters the city of Athens, it was the Holy Spirit that was already working ahead of him, right? And as Paul begins to preach, it's the Holy Spirit that gives him the words to say. And it was the Holy Spirit that was already touching hearts and lives to be able to say, we want to hear more, or to be able to say that, we, that yes, we're believing. And so the people are responding with a yes to what God was already doing. And so in the work that God is calling us to do in this community and beyond, we're not going to do it in our own strength. We're not going to do it in our own power. We need to say we need Holy Spirit power to be able to go into those places, to be able to engage our neighbors, to be able to engage the broader community around us. We have to remember that we need to rely on God moving ahead of us. We need to remember that it's God who's going to give us the words to say when we need to speak to other people. And we need to trust that ultimately God is the one who's working ahead of us, that God is going to bring people to faith as you and I simply share the good news of Jesus Christ. Beloved people, I believe that God is calling us to engage the world in which we live, that we are being called to be a people who go and fish. Let's pray. Lord, what we recognize as we come to this this morning is that it's difficult for us to know what does it mean to be in the world but not of it. Lord, we recognize we don't want to just simply look like the rest of the world. We're called to be a peculiar people. And so, Lord, in some ways, we would pray that as people look at us, they look at us as people who are peculiar, who are different, but who are able to speak their language and be able to say, I can help you connect those dots that you didn't know that even existed. They were out there somewhere. And so, Lord, would you give us your Holy Spirit's wisdom and power to be able to know how to speak to people to be able to engage them as you, as we're following the example of Jesus, the example of Paul. 
And that, Lord, as we share the hope of the gospel to trust that, Lord, it's your spirit that's already at work. And that, Lord, you are working in front of us and around us and beside us. And, Lord, just to trust you in this, Lord, we pray that you would help us to know when to speak up and how to speak up, but to do so with love and with truth and with grace. And Lord, we thank you. That it's not up to us. That it's not, Lord, that we have to kind of make all of this happen, to trust, Lord, in your Spirit's work, in your Spirit's presence in our lives. Lord, what we would ask is that you indeed would build your kingdom here and that, God, you would use us as you see fit. And we entrust all of this to you in the most wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.